Good evening and welcome to Poll. In recent months, President Karzai has faced increasing pressure to address corruption, from his controversial decision to release one of his top aides from jail to the ongoing financial crisis at Kabul Bank and a widely criticized ban preventing private security contractors from operating within Afghanistan. Tonight, I'll speak with three experts to gain more insight into President Karzai and the changing approach to corruption within Afghanistan. First, I'll discuss the financial implications of the Kabul Bank crisis with Dr. Sherazad Rahman, a professor in international business and finance at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Uh, professor Rahman, I want to thank you for joining us on our program. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I want to ask you, given your expertise in international business and finance, you know, currently there has been a, a problem with banking in Afghanistan because of an issue with uh, Kabul Bank. Um, do you think that the Afghan government should consider a system of guaranteeing deposits? Well, I, I think that the, the situation is quite serious. Uh, you're talking about the biggest private bank in Afghanistan, which holds roughly half the deposits in the entire country. And there is a danger. The panic is visible, uh, and at any moment it can tumble. And I think guaranteeing deposits is a first step. Changing the management is a second step. There's lots of things that need to be done, but they have to be done quickly. This is not the time for self-reflection. In a simple sense, how would a guarantee work? Uh, you are guaranteed up to a certain percentage of your deposit. So a, a certain percentage or a certain amount, usually it's a set amount. $100,000, $150,000. Who would pay that if the bank doesn't give you your deposit? The central bank will do that. And in this case, the finance ministry with the central bank will guarantee that. And that means the government has to keep liquid assets always available in order to guarantee this. Usually it's done through a separate agency of the, of the government, uh, and not housed in the central bank, but associated with it. Now, is this possible in a developing country like Afghanistan, where the government itself may not have a lot of reserves? I think in this case, it's absolutely necessary right now, because the danger is if Kabul Bank does go into a very serious crisis, and it looks like it may, um, and the people don't believe that it can be saved, there will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. People will stop pulling money out of that bank. And once that starts, it will go to all the other banks. And so it's not just about Kabul Bank. It's about all the banks in, Kabul, in Afghanistan. Uh, but even if people are waiting for reform, should they continue to trust their banking system because the impact could be bad for their economy? And this is when the government steps in. This is like an accident victim who is bleeding on the ground. This is not the time to ask questions of who is responsible, how we, how, what we do with this situation, that you put a bandage on it. And the bandage is, like you said, guaranteeing deposits, uh, saying we have enough money, making all the right noises and putting all the quick reforms in place. Now, what would you recommend the Central Bank of Afghanistan do at this time? Well, they've done the right steps. They've changed the top management. Uh, but I think further steps like guaranteeing, um, uh, guaranteeing deposits up to a certain amount, and not just for Kabul Bank, for all the banks. Uh, I think we have to be very careful with private banks in countries which have underdeveloped financial systems. And setting a system of supervision and reform, setting up a separate body that just supervises private banks, things like that would help right away. But isn't having private banks a good step forward so that people are not just relying on a government bank? It was a wonderful idea, uh, mobile banking. It gives access to remote areas, which is very necessary in Afghanistan. Except that if you privatize banks without adequate supervision and accounting and transparency, you end up in a situation that we have today. And so it's a balance between aggressively moving forward with modern technology, but having a support structure to also, because these are small depositors, the civil servants, uh, the police force, the security forces, have all their deposits here. So it's destabilizing in many ways if this bank goes under. Would this not providing support for this bank have a negative impact on the image of the government itself? I, I believe so in some ways because it's almost like the government is using this bank to payroll its employees and if it can't keep this bank together, what happens with other banks? I want to turn to another area, which is Islamic banking. Um, you know, the banks around the world have experienced many problems in other countries as well. Right. But Islamic banks have done relatively well. Why is that? Okay, one of the reasons Islamic banks did not get hit in the first wave of this crisis is because we were dealing with sophisticated, risky instruments derivatives. And this was in modern financial banking in big banks, global Western banks. Financial banks um, that are Islamic oriented are not allowed to deal in derivatives. And so 
so they were not touched in the first wave. But everybody got hit eventually because of the liquidity crisis. Does that mean with Islamic banking, you actually have to have a collateral or a property to back up? That's correct. There has to be some collateral property, some risk sharing that has to be involved. Uh, but what you have to be very careful because a lot of banks are selling Islamic products. But on the other side of that same bank, they're selling Western products. And so the risk issue is somewhat convoluted and somewhat confusing in, for the customers at least. So don't you think that's good to provide people choice? I think absolutely you should, but you should be very clear about truth in advertising. If it is an Islamic bank following Islamic rules and it cannot engage in certain types of activities. And I believe speculating in property deals, that's engaging in the type of activity that you don't want to happen. Overall, do you think that principles of Islamic banking are better? I think they provide stability in a certain type of crisis. And this current crisis in the United States proves the point that risky instruments require much more oversight and perhaps small investors should not be exposed to that. And uh, Islamic banking provides that safety net. But if Islamic banking is done right, I want to also touch upon the Hawala transfer system, right. which, as you know, is largely based on trust. Um, do you think that Afghans should continue to rely on the Hawala system as, as well as formal banking? Look, ideally, uh, from a government standpoint, you want to develop the banking sector because there are so many economic benefits uh, down the road and social benefits in terms of uh, standard of living. However, when there is no banking system, or, um, then the Hawala system works beautifully. It, it fills a gap. And I'm not talking about the shadow economy. I'm talking about legitimate businesses and transfers of monies from different regions or different parts of the world. Hawala fits a need because the banking system is not fulfilling the need. What could you tell Afghans, you know, why is it important to still rely on their banking system in terms of the betterment of their overall economy? Uh, in the middle of a panic, it's very hard to talk about this to people who are panicking with their life savings because then one bank looks exactly like the next bank and they can't tell the difference. The importance of keeping it in the bank is it's safer, ultimately, if the rules are in place. Um, $180 million was taken out in two days. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. That's 20% of the bank's deposits almost. That was a lot. Well, perhaps if there is competition in Afghanistan, there's you know over 10, 15 banks privately. So if they could just move their money to another bank, maybe competition is the answer? I, I think competition is the answer. But unfortunately, in the middle of a crisis, and this happened in this country, all banks look alike. And so what the, the instinct is, take it out of the bank, wait, and then put it into another bank. So there will be that gap when there is a panic and there is a run on all banks. And that's the danger. Uh, Given where Afghanistan is now with security issues and trying to promote investment in the country, what kind of measures could the Afghan government be taking to try to provide more assurance to you know, investors to come to the country. Yeah, I, and I think that, you know, there has been a lot of investment in the country, either through the U.S. government, the military, and foreign aid organizations. Uh, unfortunately, none of them use Afghan banks as a source for their, their money. They use uh, foreign banks, like Standard Charter in Afghanistan. And perhaps uh, some deal can be made uh, or some requirement can be made that at least a portion of those funds go through local banks and they're guaranteed by the government. And that will bring more liquidity into the system and much needed liquidity for the Afghan people for loans. Well, Professor Rahman, I want to thank you for your time in joining us and providing your insights on banking worldwide as well as what uh, the Afghan government can do to help its banking system. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. When we return, I'll discuss the political consequences of the Kabul Bank collapse and the recent parliamentary elections with an expert who has traveled to Afghanistan multiple times. I'm here with Brian Katulis, a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C., where his work focuses on U.S. national security policy and South Asia and the Middle East. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I want to start off with this issue of Kabul Bank. Do you think that President Karzai did enough to address the Kabul Bank issue, especially since his brother was a shareholder? Um, probably not in the eyes of most Afghan citizens. And I think the key would be not just what has Karzai done, but what has the system done there? The United States and other international actors have helped Afghans build 
an entire banking system from scratch or rebuild it uh, in a sense and working especially with the central bank of Afghanistan and I think the central bank has taken certain actions whether people are held to account uh, for the abuses and uh, for lost money and other things that remains an open question. But what do you think the impact has been on this Kabul bank crisis on the confidence of Afghans in their banking system? I think it's just uh, been it, it further reaffirmed a negative perception about not only the banking system but political elites being out of touch with what ordinary Afghans want and need in their societies. Uh, you know, some Afghan government officials, including shareholders of Kabul Bank, have said that the U.S. should provide money to bail out Kabul Bank. Do you think the U.S. should do that? I, I think the U.S. at this point is spending way too much money in Afghanistan. And I, I think more than the country can absorb. We're flooding the country with uh, much more money than it actually needs. And it's feeding this corruption that we're talking about. I think, you know, we can hold Afghan, uh, Afghan officials can hold other Afghan officials to account, but we need to correct our behavior and make sure that we're, we're not spending far more in excess of what, uh, what the country can absorb. Um, I want to touch upon the elections, because you have served as an election observer in Afghanistan. Um, how do you think that the recent parliamentary elections went in comparison to prior elections? Uh, it seems that, uh, as we mentioned, the turnout was a, a little bit lower. Uh, people were concerned about the security conditions. Uh, and I think it remains to be seen how well the counting process and then the dispute uh, arbitration goes. Because it, there are disputes, there will be disputes. And I think even it's, though it's a few days after the election, it's still too early to tell given how the votes are tabulated. Um, the Free and Fair Election Commission of Afghanistan has already stated that there were many irregularities during this last election. How long do you think that it will take to address those issues and do you think that it will be addressed fairly given the lack of resources um, to do so? I think it could be a matter of months again as we saw with the presidential election. It took a long time. Um, will they be addressed fairly? It depends on how the officials that are in the Electoral Complaints Com Commission uh, operate and how independent they, they, they can operate. There have been concern, concerns about its constitution and how it was formed. The Obama administration tried to actually make this a item in the spring with President Karzai of how these institutions are, are constituted. I don't think they were fully pleased with, with the results, but we'll see how they perform, and that's what the next uh, few weeks will be about. Uh, but many Afghans would say that, you know, there have been a number of elections now in Afghanistan and many of the problems that have existed, but there haven't been any changes to them. Do you think that the international community and the Afghan government has learned from the prior experiences with elections? No, not really. I mean, I think part of it is we often put an extreme focus on security, which we need to, but to the detriment of other issues like governance, which we shouldn't do. Uh, one issue I would point to is the voter registry. For years now, everybody has talked about the fact that there's no clean voter registry. We don't know what the baseline is uh, in terms of how many eligible voters there might be. That's still the case years later, after uh, tens of millions of dollars were invested in cleaning up the registry. So no, we've not learned those mistakes. Um, now you, having served as an election observer, if there's one piece of advice that you can give to improve the elections, what would that be? Well, I think investing in the human capacity in the long term to build these institutions. You can't do it in a couple of, week, a couple of weeks or months before the election. And what happens, I've seen, in these electoral processes is that a lot of enthusiasm is generated uh, in advance, uh, just a couple of months in advance. And what we need to do is actually start planning for the next round of elections. Uh, start planning with a holistic effort to train and educate those who want to be part of these uh, institutions bring in the places that, that have experience with elections and help them with not only the technology but the know-how of how to run an election. And lastly, Brian, as an expert on South Asia, you've seen the changing Karzai presidency in the last eight years. Yeah. Um, how would you define, given all the recent issues that we discussed, security, corruption, and the banking system, how would you define the Karzai presidency today and how you think he will lead in the next few years? Well, today I think he still looks remarkably inconsistent. Um, he seems unclear in terms of what it is he wants to achieve um, in the long run. I think he's not met the expectations of the Afghan citizens nor of the United States, but we understand uh, from the U.S. perspective that he is the, the leader of Afghanistan and that we need to work with him. I think going forward, I think what he needs to really think about is how does he actually share power in the constitutional arrangements that are that are out there a lot of people have talked about reconciliation and he's he himself ran on 
um, broadening the tent of reconciliation and reaching out to other forces. To make that a reality, he's going to have to think about how do Afghan power structures, as constituted in their constitution, how do they need to be restructured to, to, to accommodate all of these different interests? Well, Brian, I want to thank you for your time, for sharing your perspectives on these many issues facing Afghanistan. Great. Thanks for having me. When we return, I'll speak with an Afghan who has worked as a senior advisor to the government of Afghanistan. می خواستم اول درباره انتخابات پارلمانی ما صحبت کنیم پیشرفت انتخابات چی بود به نظر شما و مشکلات های عمده چی بود انتخابات پارلمانی بار دوم در افغانستان روز شنبه گذشته تاریخ 27 دسامبر صورت گرفت که به فضل خداوند با وجود تعدیدات که از جانب مخالفین موجود بود به صورت عموم سلام صورت گرفت عملیات مسلحانه از جانب مخالفین بسیار کم و موفقانه نبود که مسیر انتخابات تغییر بده یا در روان انتخابات کنم خلال جدی رو وارد کنه مشکلات دیگه از نقطه نظر مسائل لوجستیکی از نقطه نظر مسائل دیگه موجود بود که به گفته بنیاد آزاد انتخابات در افغانستان که نظارتگر پروسه انتخابات بود در اینجا مسائل رخ داده که شفافیت و قانونیت انتخابات در بعض مناطق در بعض حوزه های رایدی زیر سوال خواهد برد از مشکلات عمده مسئله اینا مسئله پر کردن صندوق های رای به صورت غیر مسئولانه مسئله دادن رای از طرف از جانب اطفال زیر سن واجد شرایط رایدی چرا این مشکلات ها که ما می فهمیدیم که در گذشته بود چرا رفع نشد مشکل افغانستان بسیار مشکلات زیاد در افغانستان موجود است اگر به صورت عموم ما شما ببینیم افغانستان با یک مشکل بسیار جدید جدی حکومتداری مواجه است انتخابات جز از این مسئله است مسئله حکومتداری در افغانستان تا بالا حل نشده حکومت سالم به وجود نیامده حکومت با کفایت به وجود نامده از این خاطر انتخابات هم از توقع بسیار زیاد برده نمیشه مثلا مثال عمدهش هم است که در حدود 3.6 میلیون افغان که در انتخابات شرکت کردن با اساس گفته کمیسیون انتخابات در حالی که 17 میلیون افغان کارت رایدی را به دست آوردن یعنی واجد شاید رایدی هستند خود این خود نشان میده که یک تعداد بسیار کم مردم یک فیصدی بسیار کم مردم با صندوق با پای صندوق رای خود در ایختن یا بر صندوق انتخابات رفتن اونجا رای دادن از این خاطر اینا اعتماد مردم نشان میده که اعتماد مردم بالای می پروسه دموکراسی که دموکراسی در افغانستان خیلی ضعیف شده و مردم از این کدام امید بسیار چشمگیری ندارن مگم انوزم شما فکر میکنین یک پیشرفت بزرگ از انوزم به دموکراسی به افغانستان ای که حکومت افغانستان نتونسته که انتخابات به صورت شفاف و پیش ببره دلایل مختلف موجود است دلایل سیاسی موجود است که شاید حکومت افغانستان از خود مرامای داشته باشه یا ایست که امکانات و ظرفیت های کمیسیون انتخابات معدود بوده افغان ها تجربه, تجربه شان در قسمت انتخابات انتخاب کردن کم است مشکلات موجود است یک مسائل مهم هم است که کسایی که میخواین خود کاندید کنن که چقدر مقدار پول دارن و یگان کس گفتند که به انتخابات رئیس جمهوری که خود رئیس جمهور از بانک کابل قرض گرفته بود یا کدام پول گرفته بود شما فکر میکنین که اتا شرکت ها خصوصی بتانن که پول بتن به کاندیدا؟ متاسفانه یکی از مشکلات اونده که حکومت افغانستان و جامعه بلیمری در افغانستان و او دو چار است و هر دوش مسئله نه در قسمت مسئول هستند مسئله عدم توجهشان با حکمیت قانون و شفافیت امور در حکومتداری بوده است کابل بانک و عواقب کار کابل بانک و قسمی که کابل بانک تشکیل شد و قسمی که بانک به اصطلاح اداره می شد همه چیزهای مبهم است که یک عالم سوال ها را نزد افغان ها برانگیخته است به خاطر که شفافیت در امور موجود نبود امین طوره که شما گفتین که در سال گذشته در انتخابات ریاست جمهوری کابل بانک و کمپین رئیس جمهور کرزای کمک کرده چیزی است که ما از مطبوعات شنیدیم چیزی است که مردم میگوین اما نه کمپین رئیس جمهور و نه کس دیگر شفافیت موضوع را سرش صحبت کردن این موضوعات است که باید از کمپین رئیس جمهور و تمام کسایی که خود کاندید کردن باید با مردم افغانستان حساب بتن و با مردم افغانستان حساب خود پاک بسازن دو تا کمیسیون یا آژانس نو که تاسیس شده بود طرف دولت امریکا و همکاریشان 
شما فکر میکنین که واب مستقل باشن از خود رئیس جمهوریت از خاطر یک مسائل بود که یک نفر گیر آورده بودن منطقه را باز رئیس جمهور را بخشیده بودن در مملکت حکومت و تمام مراجع حکومتی تابع قانون هستند اگر این نهادهای امنیتی در افغانستان مطابق قانون افغانستان به وجود آمدن باید رئیس جمهور و تمام اطبای افغانستان تابع از قانون باشند و از اکام از او پیروی کنند اگر اینا خارج از دایره حکومتی و دایره قانونی به وجود آمدن باید داخل دایره و چوکات قانونی افغانستان ساخته شوند و بعدا حکم از اینا واجب فرض است بالای تمام اطبای افغانستان اگر اونا رئیس جمهور هستند یا یک شروان یادی افغانستان است. منطقه یک نقطه مهم هم است که هماهنگی از این پروگرام ها بسیار ضعیف بوده در سالهای گذشته و بسیار دونرها از مملکت های مختلف آمدن در افغانستان میخواین کمک کنن منطقه در دور چوکات یک پلان ملی نیست. شما چی فکر میکنین؟ چرا دونرها یک سیستم بیتر ندارن که هماهنگی کنن کارهای خود امرای دولت افغانستان؟ بیترین مرجع گرفتن کمک های برمنی در افغانستان بودجه ملی افغانستان است کمک های برمنی باید از طریق بودجه ملی افغانستان داخل افغانستان شود و از طریق از بودجه نظارت و سرپرستی و توضیح شود این نه تنها باعث ازی میشه که در قسمت ساختن یک اداره و حکومت با حساب و با ظرفیت در افغانستان کمک شود بلکه اصاب دیهی را از جانب دونران نیز ضروری می سازه و شفافیت لازم بار می آورد برالاوه ازی که ظرفیت های لازم در افغانستان تولید می کنه که امی بودجه ملی افغانستان صاحب امی اختیار شوه که بودجه دونران را یا کمک های دونران را توضیح و پروگرام کنه در افغانستان باعث ساختن ظرفیت ها در افغانستان میشه باعث استقرار حکومت میشه و بالاخره نفع و انفاد ازو با مردم افغانستان به صورت خیلی موثرتر و به صورت دوامدارتر و خواهد رسید شما چی فکر میکنین که در این هفت سال از سال گذشته چی کارا شده و چی چالش ها است که روبرو میبینین از نقطه نظر بعض مسائل در افغانستان در هفت سال گذشته کارهای بسیار چشمگیری صورت گرفته مثلا از نقطه نظر ساختن بنیاد یک جامعه دموکراتی کارهای فوق العاده صورت گرفته مثلا ما شما انتخابات داشتیم انتخابات ریاست جمهوری پارلمان داریم انتخابات پارلمانی و این مسائل دیگه در قسمت آزادی و حقوق زنان اقدامات صورت گرفته اما قضاوت در مورد رئیس جمهور کرزای تاریخ افغانستان خود کرد خیلی زیاد است که در مورد کرزای سی و دستاوردهاش قضاوت نماییم اما باز هم بر گفتم میتون در پالوی باز کارای خوب کردن حکومت آقای کرزای یک زمینه شیوه فساد در افغانستان به صورت بسیار تاریخی فراهم نموده در هیچ وقت در طول تاریخ افغانستان فساد اداری و فساد اخلاقی در بین دولت مردای افغانستان به این اندازه که فعلا است نبوده و یک مسئله است که مایه نگرانی برای نسل آینده افغانستان خواهد بود تشکر بسیار زیاد آقای فاجوخ از وقت تان امروز از شما خیلی تشکر My thanks to Dr. Sherazad Rahman, Brian Katulis, and Barmak Kazwak for appearing on our program. We'd love to hear what you think about this or any other poll program. Just go online to aamtv.tv or visit us at tolo.tv. See you next week for another edition of Poll. خدا حافظ و ناصرتان